before him. And when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is this true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you would refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I've set up? I tell you what, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'll do one more t- I'm going to give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I've made. And when you hear the sound of the musical instruments, if you refuse, you'll be thrown into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. We, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, King. Your majesty that we will never serve your God or worship the gold statue you set up. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with anger. And have you ever saw that on your mom and daddy's face? Amen. Distorted with anger. Don't you say a word, Bethany. How many of you have seen your parents' face light up like that? He commanded that the furnace be heated up seven times hotter than usual. And then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. And they tied them up, threw them into the furnace, fully dressed with their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hotter fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers that were throwing the three men into the fire. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, we did, your king. Yes, we certainly did. Look, Nebuchadnezzar said. Look, he shouted. I see four men unbound, walking around the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like God. I want you to know God is in the fire with you. He's walking in the fire with you. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door, the flaming furnace, and shouted, Now Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out of here. And so out they stepped out of the fire. And then the officers and the officials and the governor's advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed, and their clothes were not even scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And he sent his angels to rescue his servants who trusted in him. And they defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than to serve and worship any god except their own. Therefore I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or whatever their nation, whatever language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they'll be torn to limb to limb and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There's no other God who can rescue like this. And then the king, get this, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's called favor. Maybe you didn't hear me. I said that's called favor. To even a higher position in the providence of Babylon. They didn't even smell like smoke. They went in with Old Spice cologne and they came out, what? With Old Spice cologne. God sent his angel to rescue his servants who they trusted in. And the king said, I make this decree that if you don't do it, there's going to be some misery lashed out on you. How many of you know King Nebuchadnezzar had an anger problem? Amen. He probably never heard of time out. He probably never heard of just a fine or a probation. No, they will rip your arms off your body. And then they're going to turn your houses into rubble. Hey, king, just take it easy. Get a little caffeine. Just just a little. Don't get so much as you've got too much. You had too many shots of caffeine. Watch what happened in Daniel chapter 330. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to a higher position of prominence in Babylon. That's what you get when you don't compromise. That's what you get when you don't negotiate. That's what you get when you don't make concessions. When you don't take the middle ground. When you don't have a settlement. When you don't give in. When there's no deals. When you don't cut any deals. Shout out, no compromise. Oh, that was really weak. I said, shout out, no compromise. (laughs) That's what you get. You get a God like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when you don't compromise. There's no power. There's no blessing for those who won't bow. I have seen in America, there's a glimmer of hope in America. 
we have a resurgence of boldness in the American people. American people used to be bold, brave, brash, and daring. And then, if you thought about it, back in the 70s and 80s, the government could have never locked down the Americans. Nobody would have listened to them. Nobody would have shut their doors. Nobody would have closed their businesses. Nobody would have closed their companies and their shops. They would not have listened. But because of all the politicians, because of all the social media, because of all the big dollars, because of uh, news media, medical groups, big pharma, because of all of that, they were trying to weaken the people across the nation of America and the world. And the sad part about it is many people bought into the lies. But I declare that's all getting flipped on to the devil now in Jesus' name. It's all being flipped back on the devil. American people have woken up in the name of Jesus and we've realized what's happening and there's a resurgence in boldness. I want you to know we've got a bold church. We are a bold people. When they wanted to shut the churches down and force fines on the pastors and put them in jail, people like you and me, there's something that rose up inside of me in those days when they wanted to lock us down. Something rose up inside of me. It was the spirit of Abraham, I mean, uh, uh, Abednego, Meshach, and Shadrach. That spirit rose up in me. All three boys just rose up in my, and my prayer is that it rises up in you today. I said, my prayer is that it rises up in you today. That same spirit of the three Hebrew boys, I want you to have that in the name of Jesus. Now, I remember going to a place to eat, and some of my friends with their mask on said, Preacher, you're really causing a lot of trouble. You know you're going to get in trouble you know you could go to jail. You know you could get fined. I said, no, no. I refuse to let the politicians dictate to my life. I refuse to let Fauci dictate to my life. I refuse to let WHO, World Health Organization, uh, dictate to my life. And I refuse to let MLG dictate to my life. Preacher, you're causing trouble. Well, my daddy always said my middle name should have been trouble. So I was just living up to his expectations. I want you to live up to the Father's expectations. And I want your nickname to be trouble in the name of Jesus. Trouble for the devil. Trouble for those that want to silence you and quieten you down and make you sit. The Father God wants you and I to live up to His expectations and give the devil hell like the three boys Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. Church, it's time to give the devil hell. Maybe you didn't hear me. I said, it's time to give the devil hell. He's gave enough hell to you and I. Say amen. I mean, he's already done too much damage to us, and we're not going to take it anymore. And so we're going to give the devil hell. Give the Antichrist spirit hell and tell them to go in the name of Jesus. I remember the story of the three Hebrew children back when I was a little bitty boy, and it stuck in me. It resonated with me. It resounded in me. It was a story that impacted me when I heard the story of the three Hebrew boys. When I was young, I remember my Sunday school teacher telling a story about in the Soviet Union, at a public school, the Communist Party threw a Bible on the ground and told everybody to walk by and spit on the Bible. Every student did it except for one girl. She bent down and wiped the spit off the Bible, and she kissed it, and they shot her in the head. That story stayed with me. I'm 64 years old. That story has stayed with me for 54 years. I hadn't got it out of my mind. I think about the girl. She was brave, bold, and courageous. I'm looking at a church that's brave, bold, and courageous here in Clovis, New Mexico. Somebody give me praise and glory and honor. Go ahead. I heard that if the day ever happens and it comes to America like Russia, God forbid, and you're forced to choose between serving God or death, then you've got to choose to serve the Lord. And you got to choose to take up your cross. you got to choose to follow Him. I made up my mind a long time ago, I'm in this to the death. I was determined in my life when I was 13 years old that I was going to give my life to Christ. And I would give my life for Christ. I settled out a long time ago. I'll serve God even when it's uncomfortable. I'll serve God when it's difficult. I'll serve God when it's painful. I'll serve God when it's hard. I'm going to follow the Lord. Say that with me. I'm going to follow the Lord regardless, no matter what. Despite all the consequences, despite rain or shine, hell or high water, I will follow the Lord. 
God is looking for a people who made up their mind they will follow the Lord and they will not bow to Baal. He's looking for people who will be like Joshua. Do you remember Joshua 24 verse 15? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Do you know what I found is that the people of God are very strong. I believe we've got some strong people in here, spiritually speaking. I believe you are strong. I believe you are powerful. I believe you're mighty. But you know what the problem is? So many churches, they had trouble finding a leadership that would lead. A leadership that would be the front runner. A leadership that would be the tip of the spear. A leadership that would be a trailblazer. A groundbreaker. I was furious when I watched a pastor's conference here this past week. They were training pastors. And this is what they taught pastors in America. Now, to be honest with you, three-fourths of what he said did not make a whole lot of sense. So I've, I've tried to pick apart and clean up what he said to the very best of my abilities. And I want to share with you what he said. He said, it's tempting to preach the sermon that can solve all the problems But Sunday morning is a really bad way of dealing with politics. People, because people are bound to misunderstand what you say. And some people will filter what you're saying through the existing uh, political biases that they have. He said, I guarantee you, if you go up Sunday morning and you try to preach one sermon on politics that you haven't been preaching on for a long, long, long time that your Monday morning inbox is going to be an ugly scene. Let me put my two cents in real quick before I go on with the rest of the story. Just because I don't want to be associated with anything like this coward that calls himself a pastor. I don't want to be associated with a quitter, a weakling, and a chicken. Let me just say this. I want to say the exact opposite of what he said. I want to say the exact opposite of everything he just mentioned. This is a pro-life church. We are not for the murder of babies. This church will stand with the nation of Israel and the people throughout the millenniums. This church is for righteousness. This church is for holiness. This church is not for taxing churches to pay for condoms and abortions. This church is a righteous church, a holy church, and it will always be a righteous and holy church. Now I want to continue this spineless jellyfish that calls himself a pastor, what he was saying. He said, don't preach on politics on Sunday morning because I know by Monday morning my inbox is going to look so awful. So the challenge we need is to give churches and pastors a way to head off issues and problems when we talk about politics. We don't want to put the pastor in a bind. We don't want him to preach a message that could get him in in a problem or a bad situation because he's not PC. Do you know what needs to happen to pastors like this guy? They need some heavy doses of testosterone. He said, you know, after we have our Bible studies, we'll have an after party, and that's a really good time to discuss subjects such as politics and touchy subjects. So pastors, that way you don't have to do all the heavy lifting. I'm not afraid to lift anything heavy. Maybe you didn't hear me. I said, I'm not afraid to lift anything heavy. I'm not. I won't back away. Also, frankly, pastor, you don't have to have the bullseye on your chest. I've got a big chest and I'm ready for the bullseye. And I've got a really big stomach. I can handle it. Because this way, if you run the after party in your small group community, in your Bible studies, and so forth like this, the people get mad at, at uh, my good friend Larry. The people get mad at my good friend Joe. The people get mad at my good friend Dewey. The people get mad at them, and they're not going to be so mad at you. Let them take the heat. Because when you let them have the heat, you have plausibility uh, Deniability. Thank you very much. Okay. You spit it out just about as bad as I did. What he was saying is you take no accountability for what's being taught. That's what a gutless pastor does. And this is being taught to pastors all throughout America. 
pastors, you can just say, I don't agree with everything these guys are saying, but I think they're worth listening to. That's a very classic move. That's what's being taught to pastors. Don't mention any issues. Don't mention any problems in society. Just keep preaching garbage. Just keep preaching about rainbows and unicorns and lollipops. Just preach about how to get along to go along. I don't know where they're, what they're smoking, but I want you to know they're smoking something. Pastor, stay out of politics. Don't get in the weeds of political affairs. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about right and wrong. Have your small group leaders do it. That way they'll be mad at them and you're off scot-free. They are such wusses. They want other people to die on the sword that they're not willing to die on. They're teaching pastors, not to mention abortion from the platform, not to mention anything about Israel. I'm not going to preach it, so my leaders will do it for me. You do it. You preach 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 it. So Sammy and Joe and Bob, when somebody gets mad at them, the heat's on them and it's not on me. The pastor says, I have plausible deniability. You didn't think I was going to get it that time, did you? Thank you. Thank you. That's what pastors are teaching in America today. And colleges and universities and professors and big money, like George Soros, he's trying to undermine the authenticity of the Word of God. And he's pushing pulpits to bow down to another God. So when the government says churches have to be shut down, those pastors will do it because they are scared. They're scared of their email inbox being full of haters. Linda, would you hand me my phone right there? Don't throw it. (laughs) Don't you throw it. You was fixing to. I know you. Do you know, I looked at how many emails I had. I've got two email addresses. One of them has 54,000 emails. The other has 15,000 emails. And I'm not afraid of a cotton-picking email. I don't care. I am not afraid. I'm not scared. I'm not running. I read this morning, Disease X is coming to the world. They said, WHO, the World Health Organization, the boss issues a horror warning to the world. He said it's not a matter of of if, it's a matter of when. You see, they're already planning and plotting. I will not back down. I'll go, I'll go to my death fighting. I'm not terrified or frightened. I'm not afraid. I'm not nervous. I'm not worried. I'm not anxious. I'm not alarmed. I know what they can do with those ugly emails. They can wrap them up tight and they can, never mind. (laughs) You thought I was going to say something, didn't you? But pastor, they hurt my feelings. They offended me. I'm so upset, pastor. That gutless pastor is not anything like you and me because we're not that way in this church. When you read the Bible, that pastor I spoke about doesn't remind you of Elijah. That pastor I spoke about doesn't remind you of Elisha. He doesn't doesn't remind you of David or Daniel or Shadrach or Meshach or Abednego. Those were real men. There are so many pastors that's a disgrace to the gospel of Christ. They're a shame to the cross. They're a stain on the pulpit. They haven't read Revelation 21 verse 8 lately. The Bible said in Revelation 21 8, it condemns cowards and places them alongside of the faithless, the detestable, the immoral, the idolater, the liar, the murderer, the sorcerer, and they, the Bible says, and they will burn in hell. One day, this pastor and all that he's training, they're going to have to face real men who gave their life. Like Paul, who was beheaded. Like Peter, who was crucified upside down. Like James, who was put to death by a sword. Like some that were stoned, some that were clubbed and beaten to death. Did you know John, who wrote the uh, book of Revelation, 
He was boiled in oil. And while he's sitting there boiling in oil, you know what he's doing? He's preaching the Word of God. I want you to know that's the kind of men we are in this church. That's the kind of people we are in this church. And then not only was he boiled and preaching, then he was forced to drink deadly poison. And guess what? He lived. Then he was banished to an island by himself. Guess what? He lived. I heard people say during the pandemic, Pastor, uh, that pastor that went to jail, now what a shame. Well, he should have just kept silent. He should have just shut the doors. He should, he should not have kept his church open. They called him a disgrace. They said he was dishonoring the kingdom. What? They said the church should work with the government. Do what? Let me ask you a question. If the church isn't supposed to cause any trouble, then why were half of the books written from prison? Why were they written by people who were executed by the government? We're not looking for trouble. We're not looking for a battle or a brawl. But I tell you, if push comes to shove, let's get it on, baby. Let's get it on. We'll never deny the Bible. We'll never deny our faith. We'll never deny our families. We'll never deny parents' rights. We'll never call a girl a boy and a boy a girl. We'll never agree to them going into the different bathrooms. We'll never agree letting men wear beards and beer guts and high heels get close to our kids. We will not accept it. We will not agree with anyone wanting to cut off private parts of babies and children. We're a born-again Book of Acts church at Grace Fellowship Church. If you think we're the problem, then you're clueless. The church is the only thing propping up this world we're living in. If you take out the Christians out of this place, and this thing is over in a day, I promise you. The church is the benefit to America. We're not teaching people to destroy the nation, tear down statues. We're not teaching people to, to riot and burn buildings and trash the cities. We're teaching people here in this house, in this city, we're teaching them how to do work, not depend on the government. We're the ones that don't have to be chased down for child support. Somebody say amen. We raise our families. We go to work. We pay our taxes. We contribute to a better America. You take us out of here, and I guarantee you, this country will fold like a cheap shirt. Somebody say amen. 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 If you try to make us do what the Bible says not to do and perform same-sex marriages, I dare you. I double-dog dare you. If you say we have to be forced to vote for abortion, I dare you. If you want to take our tax-exempt status, go right ahead. We'll thrive and prosper because we did before the tax status ever came along. Whatever threat you're going to make against the church of the living God, it will not go well with you. The government cannot control us. The politicians cannot dictate us. The media won't be able to shout at us long. We won't be bought off like so many churches in the last three years, even in this city. The government won't control us with money. They can't control us with threats. We are the church of the living God. I said we are the church of the living God. We will not bow. We will not bow to Baal. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now some of you might think that the devil starts really big and he's really... But the truth of the matter is he's very subtle. He gradually sucks you in like the Super Bowl commercial called Get Jesus. He gets us. That commercial, if you watch it closely, they want you to accept abortion that it's just a part of life and get over it. They want you to accept an alternative lifestyle and that's the way it is and that's the way it's going to be. And they just said, get over it. You see, it was slid in there. It looked innocent. It sounded good, but that's the way the devil operates. People don't understand how the devil works. They think there could be a demon waiting on you outside these glass doors and they're going to cut an upside down cross on your forehead and chant to Satan. No, that's not how the devil works. He's subtle, he's clever, he's cunning, and he tricks you to accept the things that are contrary to this book. It's okay to bow to the statue. 
It's okay. God knows your heart. Just go ahead. It's okay. Just one time won't hurt. Let me ask you a question. Was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the only Hebrews in Babylon not to bow? But they were the only ones we have recorded that wouldn't bow. I hear critics say, you know, guys, you can do more for the Lord if you just get along to get along and be alive than dead. You can just do more for the Lord. Just keep quiet. You know, pastor, you've got to think about your wife. What are you going to do if you're dead, if, if, if they kill you? What are you going to do? My wife is going to be very happy because she's got a lot of life insurance. <laughs> no, the truth of the matter is, if I would bow down to Baal, and if I would worship a pagan god, and if I didn't stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ, and if I acted like some of these spineless, gutless pastors and cowards we call pastors today, she would divorce me. Amen. Linda did not marry a woman. She married a man. Amen. I refuse to lose my self-respect for fear. And I refuse to lose my dignity for, and honor just to appease the devil. You know, the church is full of strong people. I believe we got some strong people in this church. We're going to be the opposite of everything the devil and the government are trying to turn us into. You see, the government and the politicians and, and uh, the devil, they're trying to make us flabby, weak, willed, spineless people. But we're really strong men. We're really strong Americans. We're really strong husbands and wives. We're really strong children. I read that they put a ladies dispenser in the boys' bathroom in Connecticut in a public school. And the boys tore it down in 18 minutes after it was installed. Good job, boys! Good job, boys! Say it with me. Good job, boys! But what took you so long? <sighs> These people are sick individuals. That garbage won't fly here in Clovis, New Mexico at Grace Fellowship Church. You see, this isn't Europe, this isn't Canada, this isn't California, this isn't Connecticut, this isn't New York. We're not some panty-wasted people here in this church. We are a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Can you give me praise and glory? Give me praise and glory. Watch what happened to the three boys. Watch what happened to the three boys, if you would. They came up out of the furnace, and the king respected them. Do you think you win people by giving up? Do you think you win people by quitting, by throwing in the towel, by saying, no mas, no mas, no mas for my Spanish friends? No, you lose respect. Those pastors that shut down their church at the drop of a hat, I have no use, no respect for. I would never jump in a foxhole with them. It's amazing. Those pastors, when the raindrops start to fall or the snowflakes are falling, pastors fold up and cancel church. That is not our story at Grace Fellowship Church. Do you think a pastor that closes a church for two inches of snow will stand against government tyranny? Do you think a pastor that does that is going to help you in the time of your greatest crisis? No, because once a runner is always a runner. It, you know, the Bible takes note of fighters like these three Hebrew boys. Men that really stand for something. People that have conviction. People that have faith. People that have confidence. Who have a passion. People who do not bow. Most churches are nowadays are ran seven to one. Women in, in favor of women. Seven to one. Some are nine to one. So many churches are effeminate. So many churches are mamby-pamby, girly, sissified. So many of these preachers will say, don't you just want to sit on Nabba's father's lap? No! No, I don't. I never did that with my father, and if I did, he would swat me away and say, get away from me. Don't do that again. You're freaking me out. God is looking for real men and women who are fighters in the kingdom. You're going to meet people in heaven like Samson. You're going to meet people in heaven like David, Peter, Joshua, Joash. What a name. If you got in trouble with Joash, he would kick your... How, 
How do you think Joash got his name? He was a fighter like David. David got sheep out of the lion's mouth. And then he said, if the lion or the bear turns on him, he beats it to death. David was a strong man. Jesus was a strong man. Pharisees came to Jesus in Luke 13, 31 and told him to leave and go somewhere else or King Herod would have him killed. And Jesus told them, go tell that fox, I'll keep healing the sick, I'll keep preaching the gospel, and I'll keep healing, uh, casting out devils. Jesus was a strong, strong man. He would not stand to being threatened and intimidated. He would not stand for that. They cornered him on a cliff. They all had stones in their hands. And Jesus said, I've done many good works. Which one are you getting ready to kill me for? And they said, we're not going to stone you for any good work. We're going to stone you because you blaspheme. You're a mere man claiming to be the Son of God. And you know what Jesus did? He wasn't afraid. He wasn't shaking in his boots. He wasn't chewing his fingernails. He had no fear. And Jesus walked right through them and no one dared lay a hand on him. He said, no one takes my life. I lay my life down willingly. You see, Paul was a wimp. They even stoned Paul. They gathered around him with stones in their hands and they buried him in a pile of rubble. And up popped Paul out of the stone. And he went back to the city and he kept on preaching. That's a real man. That's a, that's a real man. I want you to know we have real men in this church. Somebody say amen. Would you give the Lord a hand? Amen. We have real men. Real women. We're not terrified, mortified, frightened. We're not scared. We're not. So how did we get to where we're at? How did we go from that kind of history to where we are today? The kind of bloodline that Jesus had, Paul had, David had, the kind of heritage that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, the kind of legacy they had. And 2,000 years later, we've got gutless pastors Telling people how to be a generation of gutless people. That's not our story. Thank God He's rising up churches of steel, spined back believers that are serving the Lord with all their heart. And they stand for His word against the world and the demons of hell. The Bible says the three boys defied the king's command. I can hear the critics now. He's the king and you disrespected the king. You can lose your head acting like that. But the boys actually gained respect for not compromising. The boys give everyone a hard time for bowing. Did these three boys give everybody a hard time for bowing? No. How come we're supposed to respect everyone's decisions in life? You're a man and you want to dress like a woman. We're supposed to respect that? No, sir. Not going to happen. You're a man and you want to wear lipstick dresses and stilettos and read to children? No, we're not, we're not going to respect that. You want to dismember babies in the womb and throw their lifeless bodies in the trash? We're not going to respect that either. Hey, if a man is going to get a couple of implants and go to the dress barn and get a nice skirt, and we just need to be quiet about it? No. We don't say anything. Because that's their choice. Do what you want. They respect people's choice. Well, you need to too. But isn't it interesting that their one choice is important to them, but our choice is not important to them. Some churches refuse to fight and compromise, and they say, well, we have to build bridges with everybody. That's what we're here for. We're just building bridges. We want to love everybody. We want to accept everybody. Have you ever noticed it always seems like the traffic goes one way and not the other? The world does not respect spineless, gutless Christians. But there is one thing the devil respects, and that's boldness. That's confidence. That's bravery. That's power. That's strength. Matthew 7, 29, they remarked about Jesus that he had spoke as one with real authority. When you speak, I want you to speak with authority. You are the child of the Most High God. He is putting something inside of you called the Word. And the Word is sharper than two-edged sword. And it will divide and it will cut and it will bring the problems in your life down. So you speak as one with real authority. 
Some of you are going through stuff right now and you're going to fight or you're going to be a wimp or you're going to be like Jesus. Which one is it? Are you going to hold strong or are you going to wilt and compromise? I'm sure you have your own things you're facing. I'm sure that you may be in the furnace today. I'm sure the devil is making threats to you and trying to intimidate you. Don't be a coward. Anytime the devil threatens you to do something, do what the three Hebrew boys did. Call his bluff. Now, the devil might actually throw you in the furnace like he did the three boys, but your, your God is going to be able to deliver you from the fiery furnace. Somebody say amen. amen. But notice what they said. They said, our God is able and he will deliver us out of the furnace. But just so you know, even if God does it, we would rather burn in the furnace than bow to your God. That, those three boys, those three Hebrew boys, they were not bumper sticker Christians. They weren't paper doll preachers like this guy I'm talking to you about. The government loves those kind of preachers, those kind of Christians. Why? Because they can take their guns away really quick. They don't want people to have power. They want your meals dictated to you. They want you eating crickets and bugs for the rest of your life. They want money dedicated to you and dictated to you. Everyone has a universal basic income check coming to you. They want you to be unarmed so you can't do anything about the tyranny that's going to face America. The government will use preachers just like this to push their agenda down your throat. But I'm telling you, it's not going to happen on our watch. Somebody say amen. amen amen you know you could beat up a police officer half to death and get out with no bail but you knock over a statue in Iowa capital of Satan and the guy that knocked it off the head came off and he's charged with a hate crime and he's put into prison if you don't think it can't happen ask Mr. Cassidy a Navy war veteran a Christian conservative he would not allow that to stand in his capital. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, Iowa, you better fix it before God does. Because there's consequences for you bowing to other gods. God not only delivered the three Hebrews from the fire, they were promoted to a higher position. Now let me tell you something, God promotes you to a higher position. The devil does what? The God promotes and the devil demotes. And you know where he's demoting you to? The pit of hell. The devil tells you, you'll get promoted if you bow. That's a lie. But watch this. The only people that died in that furnace were people that bowed. Those soldiers that threw the three Hebrew boys in. The men that threw, in, threw them in, they died. They perished. They had a terrible death. Killed by the flames. They bowed and they burned. If you bow, you'll burn. And if you don't bow, you can Never burn, because Jesus is going to stand with you. I see Jesus standing with you in everything you do. I see Jesus standing with you in everything you do. You're not going to do it in your own strength. He's going to give you strength in Jesus' name. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 4, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. That means if I'm a pastor and I write a book and the ladies on The View want to promote it, then I wrote a very bad book. <laughs> the devil's tempting you today. The devil is tempting you today. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 and 29, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. I'm telling you, church, live as a citizen of heaven conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you're standing together with the Spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. I've got news for you, Grace Fellowship Church. I've got good news for you. We are fighting together for the faith, which is good news. We will not be stopped. We will not be intimidated in verse 28 in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you're going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Don't ever be intimidated by the enemy. Don't allow yourself to be intimidated by the enemy. 
God is a furnace delivering God. I said he's a furnace delivering God. So don't be afraid of death. Here's the scripture that you won't hear any church today this Sunday morning. I promise you. Matthew 10, 28. Don't fear men who can destroy your body on earth, but can't do anything to your soul. But fear God who can both destroy your body here and destroy your soul in hell. You can put a bullet through my head, but I'm not going to finish. Because to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. You see, I'm not finished because I would receive a martyr's crown. I don't have a fear of death. I have a reward in heaven. Say, I receive it. it. How many of you feel boldness being pushed up in your spirit this morning? I want to look over here. Does anybody here feel boldness pushing up? Does anybody here feel boldness pushing up inside? Don't make, am I just imagining it? Does anybody here on this side feel boldness pushing up in your spirit? Come on, let me see you. Let me hear you. Let me know. Boldness. It's coming in the name of Jesus. The devil tempts you to bow. He says, I'll give you anything you want. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, the righteous is as bold as a lion. So you stand up there, be a righteous person, and it's going to produce boldness in your life. Make whatever threat you want, devil. Devil, you don't control my money. You don't control my wife. You don't control my life. You don't control my family. You don't control my children. Doctors insist that you've got to get your children shots. Does that child have the hospital's last name or my name? Don't let people talk you into things that you don't want to be talked into. Every man that's in this place that has a child say, I'm the father of my home. Would you say it like you mean it? Don't let people talk to you like that that wants to dictate to you how you should live and what you should do with your kids. You're the high priest, Father. Not the Department of Health. Not some unelected bureaucrat. Not the school board. Don't let others dictate to you how to raise your children, how to uh, transition your children. Did you know Florida is trying to teach a 12-month school year right now? They're trying a 12-month school year in five different districts right now. Why do they want to have your kid there year-round so they can control you and the kids? It's enough of a hostile takeover. We have had enough. I don't know about you, but I've had enough. Say, I've had enough. The devil came to Jesus in the wilderness, and after three times, he was gone. Just resist the devil. The Bible says in James 4, 17, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Keep me in prayer, pastor. I'm being attacked. That's not resisting. Oppose the devil. Fight back. Attack the devil. Speak the word with boldness. And when you do, the boldness and the blessing of God is going to find a way to you. And God's going to open up the windows of heaven and he's going to pour out all the blessings that you cannot contain. The devil's not running the show. We've let him run it too long because we answer to God and his word. There's a lady running. I'm almost through. I'm almost through. So just give me just a minute. There's a lady that's running for Senate in, America, in Arizona. I'm not endorsing her. Don't panic. Don't get all bent out of shape. But I want to show you there are people that really do refuse to be manipulated and intimidated. Her name is Carrie Lake, and she's running for Senate. She got a call from the head of the GOP, the Republican Party. He told her that men back east sent him to tell her to pause her campaign for two years. And if you will pause your campaign and just stop, they will pay you whatever you want. That is a Republican, that is a GOP leadership, and God is going to clean His house in this country. I believe that. Unrighteousness is going to get driven out of America in Jesus' mighty name. God is going to restore what's been damaged in America. It's happened in Texas It's happening on the border. It's happening in Arizona. It's happening in a New Mexico Democrat Senate. A New Mexico Democrat Senate led. They shot down Michelle Lujan Gresham and put more holes in her than she's had in a lifetime. 
She was overreaching. She was trying to take our Second Amendment right from our people, and that's not ever going to happen. And the Democrats said no to MLG. She was trying to do medical leave bill that would cripple small businesses in New Mexico and literally devastate them. I'm telling you, she's fuming. I'm telling you, she's hopping mad. If you see a little tyrant jumping up and down in Santa Fe, that's her. The devil's not going to have this station and the devil's not going to have this state. I want you to watch this now on the screens. You're going to hear how the devil works. And you're going to hear how you should respond when the enemy wants to manipulate you and intimidate you. Roll it! Carrie Lake is here listening. All right, she's going to join us on the back end of this. What you're about to hear is the Arizona GOP party chairman, Jeff DeWitt, talking to Carrie Lake about how someone back east wants her to drop out and is willing to pay her big money to do it, trying to probe how much it will take to get her out and someone else in. Who? Someone who can be controlled? Someone who's not MAGA? Someone who will do so, this imaginary sort of party boss? I mean, there is somebody. Even DeWitt seems to be admissing, admitting this is not a made-up thing. Uh, to do that person's bidding? Who? Again, we're going to listen to an excerpt of this long call, and Carrie Lake will be on right after. The recording's it's extraordinary. Take a listen. This is, this is, this is back east. They, there are very powerful people that want to keep you out. I the know what they do. But they're willing to put their money where their mouth is in a big way. So, this conversation never happened. This is crazy, though. They should want me. I'm a great candidate. People love me. These people are corrupt. If you, if you, if you say no, which is fine, it's your choice. Don't tell people. I know. They're going to try to have me murdered. <laughs> so what, what, what's going on? Who is it? What? Forget the who. Let me just tell you the what. Let's just say there are people calling around saying, gosh, no, they can't repeat this. Never repeat this. If you say no, don't. If you say, well, I got offered to buy out. Don't. Yeah. Don't. Here's this, my problem. Rather than just say, let's work with her, she's a great candidate. Because they don't own me. And it pisses me off. Yeah, it's not about it's about ownership. It's about control. I don't know if it's about control. It's about being on the team. But if they're pushing a globalist agenda, I can't do that. So what do they want? What do they want me to do? You want to stay out of this. <laughs> but I'm tell you what I can offer you. I said you can do whatever you want. It's a talking head, this and that. So the, the ask of me was, it's kind of funny. So the, the ask I got today from back east was, this is he has to say us. Was, is there any companies out there or something that could just put her on the payroll and give her to keep her out? And I said, well, what do you want to do? Like, whatever we need to do. This is about defeating Trump, and I think that's a bad, bad thing for our country. DeSantis is not America first. This is about That's good. the final. Do you understand how the devil works? The devil come in a blue suit and tie. We'll give you anything. Just step aside. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. This guy was a Republican that wanted to offer her something so she would step down, but she was a person of good, strong faith and belief in what she was doing. And what happened? This tape got leaked and he got fired. He got fired. And you know what happened? The next day she soared in polls. You see, that's what happens. You follow God and you will be promoted to greater heights than you've ever been before. The devil is a liar. Let me ask you a question. If she can't win, why are they trying to buy her out? Because she can win. Don't let the devil tell you what you can do and can't do. 
You are going to win. You will be a champion. You will be victorious. You will not bow. You will not break. You will not bend. You're leaving here today with strength inside of you to do what God has called you to do. Everybody stand on your feet today. Give Him praise and glory, would you? Stand to your feet. As you're standing, I want you to hear this. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5. David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath, and David used it to cut him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they turned and they ran. Your boldness takes strength out of your enemy. 1 Samuel 17, 52, the Bible said, And then the men of Israel, the men that were cowards, the men that were afraid, the men that wouldn't fight Goliath, those men of Judea gave a great shout of triumph. And they rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath, the gates of Ekron, and the bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn alongside the road from as far as to the east to the west. When David won his battle, all the cowards that refused to fight Goliath suddenly got boldness. Suddenly got boldness. Your life is going to be bold. And we're going to inspire people. We're going to inspire them to be godly. Inspire your children. Inspire them with you being an honest person. There's somebody that doesn't get drunk every night. There's somebody that's not sleeping around every day. They will see that there's actually righteous people in America. It's going to inspire righteousness from other people. Somebody has to be the tip of the spear. Somebody has to be bold, brave, and courageous. This church is full of people that are the tip of the spear. We don't need a crowd to get involved. We jump at the chance. Elijah said, I'll do it. I'll go to the prophets of Baal. I'll call down fire from heaven. I'll stand. I'll stand when it's hard. I'll stand when it's difficult. I'll stand when it's not popular. I'll never back down to Baal. The devil can make you bow. They made me get vaccinated, Pastor. No, they didn't. You did it because you were weak. But you're a child of the Most High God. When you make Jesus your Lord, then no one else can be your Lord. You take orders from the Lion of Judah, and His name is Jesus. Can somebody shout, Amen? Give Him praise and glory. If you go to my office, look at the pictures on the walls, you'll see lions. You'll see lions. I'm going to stand with the Lion of Judah. You're not going to die. You're not going to sell out. You're not going to quit. This devil cannot take what's yours. It's time to stand. Maybe there are those of you here today that you've never stood for Jesus. But today is your day. You said, Pastor, I've compromised. I've quit. I've thrown up my hands. But today I take a stand, a public stand. If that's you, you're standing. The Bible says, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you've never made a public decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're standing to your feet right now, if you'll come quickly out of your seat and stand right here, I want to pray for you. We're going to pray, and we're going to say, God, I give you my life. God, this is your day. I'm going to follow Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. If you've never been saved, if you've never done that, get saved today. Are you here today and you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You'd like to ask Him to come into your heart? You know, for 30 years, we've heard people say, oh, just stay in your seat, raise your hand. And what has it produced? A generation of people staying in their seat. We can sit in the seats at Denny's and have the Grand Slam breakfast. But when we come here, it's to the throne room of God. Would you lift your hands? If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, just say, Heavenly Father, I turn back now to you. I turn away from sin. Lord, I repent. I believe in my heart that Jesus is raised from the dead. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And I receive forgiveness by the blood of Jesus. I'm saved and I know Jesus. If you just prayed that prayer, 
Maybe you did it a long time ago, but you've wondered and you strayed. I want to pray for you. I want to lose boldness on your life. I want you to take a stand in the fiery furnace. And once you do, you'll find Jesus was there all the time. I want you to be bold as a lion. I want you to go forward and never backward. If you would like to ask Jesus in your life right now, would you come quickly? Come quickly. You'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus. I want to, I want to be bold like you've talked about today. Anybody here today? Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I haven't been brave, bold, and courageous. I've ran from the troubles. I've ran from my past. I've ran from when the devil says, boo, I'm out of here. If that's you, I'd like to pray for you. So you'd have boldness. How many of you need boldness today? Anybody here? You'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I want boldness. If that's you, would you come quickly? Come quickly. I just want to pray for you. I just want to lay, lay hands on you, pray for you. Where are you at? Come on. Move. Move. You be the very first. You be bold enough to move. Come on. You be bold enough. I know there's others that need to come. I know that there's others that need to come. Who's going to follow this one? Who's going to follow this one? Who's going to say, I want boldness, Pastor. I want to be that man. I want to be that woman. I want to be bold. I want to be bold. Who wants to come? Who wants to be prayed for? Who wants hands laid on them so they can receive boldness? Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Hurry. 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 Bold. 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 Give them a hand, would you? Bold. Bold. Come step right up here, guys. Lord God, now we're praying for boldness. I'm praying for Michelle to be bold. I'm praying that she's bold. She is not some weak, frail, feminine woman. She's a mighty warrior in the kingdom. And Lord, I call her I call the Spirit of the living God to come alive inside of her. And I say, be bold. Be bold. We're not going to back away. We're not going to shy away. We're not going to be intimidated. You're going to receive that. You came ready to receive. Just receive it right now. Just say, I receive that right now, Lord. I receive it. I'm bold, bold, bold and courageous. Bold and courageous. Bold and courageous. Michelle's probably one of the quieter ladies in the church. We don't have a lot of quiet ladies. We got a lot of Leah's and Linda's. A lot of Dana's and Jennifer's. But I, I want to tell you something. God's ready. God's ready. God's ready for you to walk in boldness like you've never had before. Yes. Amen. Amen. I receive that. I receive that word. I receive that word. Amen. Lord God, my good friend Cynthia, she's the other, the other quiet one in the bunch. Would you put on her a boldness that she's never, ever, ever dreamed she would have? Would you make her bold as a lion? When the attack comes, she goes after it. When the devil raises his ugly head, she goes after it. I impart to her a boldness. I transfer that to her. I confer that to her. Bold as a lion. Never, never the same. Unleash your goodness on her. Unleash your anointing on her. I receive that. I receive that. I'm going to have it. I'm going to have it. It's mine. It's mine. It's all yours. Just receive that. Just take it. You're okay. Just take it. 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 Two special people. 
wanting more of God, wanting more of God, more of God every day. Touch my people. Touch my people today. Bold as lions. Bold as lions. Bold as lions. Never intimidated. Never backing away. Bold. Bold. Impart to them boldness that they'd never ever dreamed they'd ever have. Make them bold. You receive that today? You receive that today? You receive that today, Hannah? In Jesus' mighty name, just bold. Take that. Take that. I receive it. We're going to have that. We're going to have that. We're going to have that. It's ours. 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 I receive that now in Jesus' name. Cool up. What do you think? Nina, did you understand much of what I said today? Did you understand a little? Mui Paquito? We've got a, a really special lady here. My friend speaks limited English. She knows very little English, and I know very little Spanish. Do I have a translator up here? Anybody? Nelly, where are you at? Or right, Lydia, come up here, Lydia. Just lay there and rest. Just lay there and take it. Just lay there and take it. I want to hear what Nina has to say. Ask her what she came for today. 